And you do want this, some of it. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Uh, do you want ice in it? No, I'll take it straight. All right. Well, uh, here. Cheers. cheers. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, that's really good. I know. I, I love it. <laughs> okay, uh... I'm Ryan Brown, and this is the Unvarnished Podcast, and I just flew in today, uh, this evening, from uh, Utah to New York and drove up to Connecticut to hang out with Jennifer Gennari. Um, and uh, yeah, so where, where are we exactly? We're in Ridgefield? No, Redding. Close. We're in Redding. Redding. Yeah. Okay. Connecticut. In a home that was built in 1762 that's so cool um i'll get some shots around uh for for a little outro because it's such a beautiful place thank you um and we met um let me let me think you went to the florence academy when 2005 to 2008 all right maybe it was 8 to 11 I think it was 8 to 11. 8 yeah. to 11. That makes mm. more sense because yeah. I graduated in 8. Mm. Okay. So I, I don't remember uh, us overlapping mm -hmm. much. Yeah. Uh, so you you would have started in the fall? I did, yeah. Okay, so we wouldn't have overlapped at all. Um, and what took you to the Florence Academy? Um, well, I well before I got there, um, I was living in Missouri, uh, working for Hallmark Cards, and okay. I hated it. Um, I've been to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. <laughs> have you? I've visited. <laughs> yes. Well, look, it was it is a great job. It, it was one of those places where uh, they showed you everything, and the, the facility was gorgeous. Everybody was super sweet, and. Um, it was a great job. Like what I had to do, I was doing little, um, like design work, uh, for cards and, um, they showed me my cubicle and I just sort of had this little voice just saying like, you can't stay here. Yeah. Like you just can't do this. So it wasn't, you weren't writing the text. You were doing the, de the design. Work. I was doing the design. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and so, but the, um, I guess two years later I, I left. Um, but what I was doing while I was there was I always had this pull, like, um, because when I went to college, I was doing illustration. That was my major. And, um, when I was doing any illustration, it was always some kind of paint. And then I gravitated very quickly towards oil paint and, uh, um, I was decent at it, uh, doing like illustration, more cartoon like work. Um, but I wasn't really good at it. And so I always had this pull. Um, so being so unhappy at work in Missouri, I would go home every day and, and paint. Um, yeah. and again, like it just still wasn't good. It was like this weird compulsion to just do this thing. Like it felt yeah. like that's what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and then I, I, just found out about Florence Academy uh, on a whim. And I think probably about five months after that, put my stuff in a storage unit and wow. uh, back in New York, because that's where my family uh, is. And where um, in New York, uh, Long Island. OK. Um, and so that's where you grew up. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And uh, yeah, a bunch of them are still there. And um, so they took care of my stuff and um, my cat duke <laughs> um yeah and, and i i flew out to florence from there uh just immediately after that to just finally learn how to do this thing i yeah. was clearly obsessed with for some reason so you clearly had an idea uh of the type of work you wanted to do because you don't necessarily commit to an international move going to the florence academy unless you're you know pretty into representational drawing and painting right and, and at that mm -hmm. point it it was a little bit more well known like i found it in 2001 mm -hmm. um internet was pretty young it didn't have a whole lot of online and mm -hmm. some you know academic figure drawings um i didn't i kind of went to the florence academy pretty blind i didn't mm -hmm. know exactly what i was getting but by by 2008 um it, it had a little bit more 
uh, online presence and pe- mm-hmm. you, you knew a little bit more what you were going to get when you went there. Um, so you, were you always drawn to representation? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, but I mean, I can't, I can't say that I knew more than maybe you did going there. Um, I really, it was very much like how I would paint after work on some kind of compulsion that it was just this blind thing that I was doing. Getting to Florence was kind of the same thing. Yeah. Like it, I just knew that the school had the skill I wanted and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with that skill. Um, I just wanted to understand how to put paint on a canvas. Um, and I felt like Florence had that and that's why I went there. (laughs) Were you shocked when you got there and you're spending, you know, you jump right into say a bar drawing and, uh, I mean, my experience was, the first day I, I finished it in like an hour and a half mm-hmm. <laughs> finished it <laughs> and the, the girl next to me from Sweden is just like rolling her eyes like this kid's gonna get murdered <laughs> in his yeah. critique which I was uh and then and then you start in on a on a figure drawing that's four weeks mm-hmm. and uh five days a week three hours a day for four weeks which is insane mm-hmm. I thought there's there's no person on the planet in their right mind that would spend that amount of time on a drawing. Yeah. Um, did you have that initial shock to your system when it uh, came to this new way of training, this sort of slower pace, meticulous um, way of going about things? Or was it totally refreshing? Well, it was weirdly familiar. Hmm. Um, so I, I was surprised about... Um, uh, the figure drawing like I I just like I had never spent that kind of time on on a figure drawing before because again um Ringling College was where I went before that okay. and um in Sarasota mm-hmm. okay and there would be a, a model once in a while um uh because there was like there was uh on top of all your illustration stuff you'd get thrown into like a live class once in a while and but it was never that long. So when I when it was time to to work from the model, I kind of just sort of thought it would be the same kind of duration. You know, yeah. like I guess we'll work on this for like what three days. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Absolutely not. So that was that was shocking. But the reason why ultimately a lot of it was really familiar to me, like working from a, a barg and was when I was a kid that's like all I would do, not barg drawings, but like I was obsessed with like every kind of like anime and cartoon and I would just get books and wherever I just sort of decided that wherever there was a picture, I was going to just copy it and I turn the page and I just draw and copy it. And Mm. I would spend hours and hours on this thing. It was like my whole life growing up. So to get back to doing a barg, it almost felt like, Certainly not easy, but it was like, oh, I know how to do this. It was intuitive. And, yep. And I just sat there and did it. And it was <laughs> like meditative. It was like, all I got to do is render this. And it just actually felt great. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I, I had such a shock to my system. I think it was the third day. And um, I was, you know, working on the spark. Nobody told me how to set it up. I got there in January. So uh-huh. I, I didn't get the preliminary thing and... So I, I still didn't know what site size was. Right. Um, I mean, I had kind of figured it out just by looking at other people. Uh, um, and then um, I'd stumbled through the figuring out how what they were expecting. But I remember leaving school, walking back to the apartment and telling my wife, we're leaving. This is bullshit. I, <laughs> this is so stupid. And then... <clears throat> like a like a ticker tape across my mind um the words like i I could see the words Mm -hmm. uh, of the question and it was what do they want it perfect and then it's a slap in the face like Mm -hmm. yeah that's what they want right and uh it was really really difficult for me it was a slap in the face and then an immediate clarity of shit, do I want to work that hard to get as perfect as I can? Mm-hmm. 
because I don't know how fun that's going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, that's going to be a, a comp- I knew I knew with absolute clarity that if I chose that path, it was going to mean my entire life mm-hmm. and a commitment and discipline I'd never even tried for mm-hmm. uh, at a level I've never tried for before. Um, and I didn't know if I was mature enough or or if I even wanted to create that amount of discipline in myself Mm -hmm. or if I wanted to just have fun with art Mm -hmm. and then my my sports just competitive nature kicked in (laughs) and I was like well if these guys can do it Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do it better yeah and uh, and I didn't I I it maybe hope hopefully matched the people around me Mm -hmm. but but that was the drive it was like I can't go the rest of my life knowing that I I chose specifically not Mm -hmm. to be as good as I could possibly be right right and uh and day four my whole life was changed from day three to day four yeah it was really just maybe the most pivotal moment for me Mm -hmm. um and it was the initial shock of the expectation of of greatness yeah and sure. I'd never been in an environment like that mm-hmm. before. Good enough was always good enough. Yep. And um, so, yeah, it, it, I think uh, it came along at the right time. I was 26, so I was a little bit more mature. I had a little bit more life experience. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I could have gotten to that place younger. Mm-hmm. I'd like to think I could have, but mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, that was but, like how old I was when I got there. I was right around 26. Yeah. Um, and I think that that probably was also the, the best age for me to have gotten there. Um, because I had, I had done stuff, you know, I had a job for a while. I, uh, went to college, but, um, I, I feel like I was ultimately like pretty sheltered somehow. Like there was a lot I was, I felt like I was unaware of and like a lot of it just sort of feels like a haze looking back on it. Not my time in Florence, but like just imagining or looking back on what I feel now, I didn't know. Yeah. Um, but See, that's, that surprises me because I, you know, I'm a Utah kid raised Mormon. When you say sheltered, I'm, I, I'm desperately aware of what <laughs> sheltered <laughs> can be. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, when you say you, you raised in Long Island, I just think, Oh, you have the world at your fingertips. Mm-hmm. You're a you, New York girl. And, mm-hmm. And all of the culture and exposure to to everything going on. Yeah. Um, do you feel like when, when, so so when you sh- say sheltered, can you explain that a little bit more? Because to me, you you had you know so much more mm. probably uh, broad awareness of the world than than I did. But that's not necessarily true. That yeah. would just be my assumption. Yeah. So what do you can you explain that? I think that. Um, it's good to not underestimate how much Long Island is a bubble. Yeah. Um, and just because it's close to New York City doesn't mean that people are going there. Yeah. Uh, you'll get, of course, plenty of people who do, obviously. Yeah. Um, but it's sort of this weird thing where it's like Long Island is not New York. It's Long Island. Yeah. And um, you just sort of stay out there. And Is this- there a certain sense of pride with that? That, I like, so. like, yeah, the, yeah. I mean, what did they say? Strong Island, that's what they yeah. say, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, so I never went into the city when I was younger. Um, yeah, everybody I knew kind of thought that it was scary. My family mm. thought it was very scary, so you yeah. just didn't go in there, and um. And I just sort of stayed really close to home when when I was really young. And um, and my my parents ended up getting divorced. And the way that that worked was um, I kind of ended up splitting my time between uh, being with my mother and then being with my father. My father went to Jersey. Okay. Um, so I just sort of like skipped over the city. Sure. It was like I went to Long Island and then I went to Jersey. Yeah. And um, having a bit of a divided life um, didn't really leave a lot of room for um, me to, uh, I guess, dis- somehow I just didn't really discover a lot about myself. Yeah. Um, so I just sort of stayed on Long Island, um, landed in college in um, Sarasota, and that was a shock because that was really like one of the only times I left like alone. Yeah. Um, and um, 
yeah, I don't know. It was just like, I really feel like I was in a bit of a haze when I was younger, just very surprised by everything I was around, yeah. like leaving Long Island and then being in Florida and like just uh, new people. And it was just, it feels like there were life experiences that should have been had leading up to this. And I just got smacked by it all yeah. the time. It was like, oh, here's college. Yeah. <laughs> like, here's your job. And like Florence was really the same thing. It was like, by the time I got to Florence, it was like, oh yeah, they don't speak English here. It was like, seriously, <laughs> like I, yeah. I just, there's a lot of things I shouldn't have missed that I missed. <laughs> yeah. Are you, uh, is your family Italian? Um, uh, yeah, they are. Um, but I think I'm, third generation okay. so um do you know where removed. they're from did you go like visit calabria cool. rome and maybe there was like some naples in there but i don't know those the are the two i know Napoli's for sure mafia <laughs> yeah they are <laughs> <laughs> yeah well um yeah, that's so interesting. And and then when you get to Florence, you it's a melting pot. I mm -hmm. mean, you have like 40 countries, yeah. you know, and represented among the student population. And mm. uh, so you would have been there still before they got the nice new place. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you went to Cassine and then Bandera. Mm -hmm. Did it ever flood in Bandera? Never flooded when I was uh, there. I know about it, but it didn't flood when I was, was there. It was the worst. It was. I was just uh, last year talked to Leo, uh -huh. and we got to reminisce <laughs> about the raw sewage coming up through the floor. I heard about that. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was really bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that was one of the benefits of Florence. Um, as I was setting up, we were talking about the school I I ran, and one of the things I felt like I never really offered my students was that larger student population that uh, gave them the, the larger culture mm -hmm. uh, and the, the wide variety of thought and approaches and, mm -hmm. and life experiences that you get to share among the student population that makes your school experience that much mm -hmm. more beneficial. Right. Um, and of course, the city mm -hmm. itself, the history and the culture and the architecture and, mm -hmm. the, and the art is so inspiring. I just felt like, you, you know, the, the, daily doldrums of life set in no matter where you are mm -hmm. and the routine and the the boredom sets mm -hmm. in no matter where you live but I felt like in Florence I was never I was never bored mm -hmm. uh, um, I you know the bike ride back and forth every single day was a joy mm -hmm. there was always something to see even if you've seen it a thousand times right. um the food never got old mm. uh the you just it oozed history mm -hmm. and i i just i i think that's one thing that i'm chasing at mm -hmm. this point is um that life that affords constant inspiration mm -hmm. you know you look at a, a flower growing out of the side of the stucco of an old building mm -hmm. or something and it's just like i gotta put a model in front of that or <laughs> uh, or just do a, like a plain air of it or mm -hmm. it, there's a there's a beauty to the place that um america doesn't have in in very many places mm -hmm. boston has some charm to it mm -hmm. um this house has <laughs> some history and charm <laughs> yeah, to for it sure. um but it, it and and uh yeah, so I've been trying to convince my wife to buy a chateau in France, but <laughs> that, that I hope is in our future. Um, but that was a big part of it, and I felt like I wasn't giving that to my students. Mm. You know, the, the number of students that you could interact with and mm. hang out with and build relationships with was such a, a beneficial part of my education. Um, and then you, you came back, and we met at the, at the Portrait Society. I don't even remember what year it was. Yeah, I don't remember either. Um, 14, 15, 16, some, somewhere around yeah, there. You I had, I think, was it a self-portrait in the show? No, um, it was a I portrait. I remember a, a woman in yellow, and it was really grand and beautiful. And um, it, was, um, um, it was a portrait of my friend. Okay. Um, but yeah, that I, and I don't even remember when I painted that. I really, <laughs> I don't remember the year. Um, <laughs> That was a fun year, though, like meeting up and just being yeah. around everybody. It was really I mean, Portrait Society is great like that. But I mean, yeah. that's like kind of what you're saying with um, 
what what you wanted to provide to your students like having that uh, like being able to cultivate that strong environment it's like just you just really feel something when you're around um a, a group of good people and yeah. uh portrait society definitely provides that just yeah. like the inspiration just even if they're people you don't know you're going to meet people and um just everybody's having a great time so yeah i mean we stayed up till two three in the morning talking and um that happens basically every night. Mm. And I think that, yeah, that sense of community is amazing, but I've said this a million times before, but we're in a profession that is unlike a lot of professions in that they're, we all have egos, but they're not the type of egos that, um, it, there, there's a humility there because what we do is so hard. Mm-hmm. We all know that it's yeah. really hard. We all we all have the uh, a healthy amount of self loathing uh-huh. that, that comes <laughs> with the realization that we're just uh. constantly trying to get better. But I think that that innate or, or that built in humility, mm-hmm. um, it 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 sort of holds that ego in check Mm -hmm. and and i mean you have to have a certain amount of ego to assume that you can do this Mm -hmm. uh to to like pretend every day that you can actually make this crazy thing your life Mm -hmm. uh but the humility is there among 99 percent of Mm -hmm. artists and we're very lucky to be in a profession where most of the people you meet are amazingly cool Mm -hmm. Uh, and and um very giving and and there's a solidarity there where you really distinctly know what this other person has gone through Mm -hmm. maybe not their life story or Mm -hmm. all of their experiences but there's a commonality to the difficulties and the struggle and exactly you identify with the struggle for sure yeah yeah and and i think there's a great appreciation for for people that do it Mm -hmm. because you know how hard it is you Mm -hmm. know what kind of dedication it is and And whatever their focus is, whatever stylistically they choose to paint, um, I think there's just a general appreciation that they're doing it and Mm -hmm. that they're living a creative life. Yeah. And the Portrait Society for me is one of the best um, conferences. I mean, there's there's some, I don't know of many conferences. There's some conferences, but Mm -hmm. Portrait Society has always been one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Um, They they do such a good job every year. Are you going this year? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not participating in any way, mm-hmm. um, but I, I I got a hotel room. Yeah. So um, my participation is in the evenings. <laughs> I just want to hang out with people. Good. Really. Well, I'll see you there. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm gonna be. Uh, I'm a, I'm a faculty member. Oh, nice. So, so, so are you doing the face off? I am. Yeah. Nice. Doing the face off. And That's then, fun. I've done that. And yeah, it's fun. Yeah, for sure. I love it. Yeah. Um, like, well, I mean, I've never done the face off before, but I, you know, I've painted it in public a bunch and I always feel like, I think some people get really nervous about stuff like that. It's like, Oh, I'm in, pu- people are looking at me <laughs> right. and, and I'm like totally set to do the worst painting, you know? And I feel like it's understood. It's like, you're, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, what do you expect? It's like, yeah. there's a ton of people around. We're all talking to our friends and we're all just having a good time. Yeah, it's do a, you really expect is, the painting to be good yeah, too? Yeah, <laughs> it's a small amount of time. Um, yeah, it's not some, it's not a competition. Yeah. Um, I remember the first time I did it, I was right next to Casey Baugh and, mm-hmm. and I think he's he's you know a good showman and oh, I'm just sure. boring and stupid, and that made me so nervous. I was like, do I really? Can you just put me up to the in a corner? Oh. I just put me in a dark corner by myself. <laughs> uh, but yeah, after that, I, it, it became just fun. Mm. I had to let loose and yeah, and, uh, that's the best. See, people just want to see you have fun. Yeah. you know, it's like yeah, they want to see a good painting, but like they. The best thing is just when you can watch somebody have a good time yeah. doing and something. And it's the opening night. It's yeah. really just to kind of get everybody in and excited. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, I, I love those events. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like a little mini reunion. Mm-hmm. You know, that and um, I'm doing the plein air convention this year. Um, it's, you know, it's a slightly different crowd. It's mm-hmm. bigger. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's maybe not as intimate. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've done the, the face conference. Mm. It, was, it was really fun the, the, the three times I did that. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, it's just, it's like, uh, it's a little mini summer camp. Yeah, for sure. For artists. Yeah, yeah. So, 
yeah, I'll I'll uh, I'll see you there. It's in D.C., which is awesome because there's so many great museums. Mm-hmm. So uh, anyone who knows when I'm going to post this thing, mm-hmm. hopefully I'll get it up before the Portrait Society. <laughs> if you're thinking about coming, come and watch Jen. <laughs> do her face off cheer her on yes please <laughs> watch me do the world's worst painting i don't care <laughs> um yeah so it'll it'll be great though yeah yeah but here i have a question for you i i'm hung up i keep having this circling around in my head because okay. you were talking about um uh just in, the inspiration you felt in florence and uh, look it's an inspiring city but um, I'm, I'm sort of wondering, it's like, cause I feel like so much is just our perspective on things mm-hmm. and you can get anything out of anything. Sure. And I feel like I would wonder if you were finding that the level of inspiration you were finding because of how in love with the town you were. And I wonder if you could like really cult like, Think about what you liked so much about that, like how that inspiration got pulled out of you. And I would wonder if you'd be able to find that really anywhere, you know? It's like, cause you say yeah. that you don't find it so much, say in America, but, um, and maybe you well, would Well, specific but... things uh, that are particular to maybe Europe, which mm-hmm. is the architecture mm-hmm. that I love and the, the history, um, obviously with my upbringing in America and, and the art that I, studied the most um western culture is Mm -hmm. uh what i'm most familiar with Mm -hmm. but the the cities the architecture the food the history just has always fascinated Mm -hmm. me i mean i've been to russia a couple of times as well um and uh, obviously they have a rich artistic heritage Mm -hmm. uh, that that i I went in high school so i think i'd appreciate it more now Mm -hmm. but um even back then when I knew nothing, it was overwhelmingly amazing. Right. Um, but certainly more cold uh, mm-hmm. as a, uh, you know, the city, I mean, cold temperature wise, I was there Christmas and New Year's. So it was <laughs> insanely freezing, but, um, but also cold in terms of a lot of the architecture. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of St. Basil's is amazing. Right. Some other places are cool, but, um, yeah, it's it's not quite the same mm-hmm. uh, as the the beautiful architecture. I mean, we're looking at moving, and that's why we're out here um, looking around for potential spots in Connecticut. But, um, you know, I've been on a search, a home search, anywhere from Phoenix to what North Carolina, Virginia, all all through the East Coast, mm-hmm. and they all look the same. Right. I mean, American homes are all basically the same, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and I also spend maybe an hour and a half, two hours a day looking at French and Italian homes. Mm-hmm. And they're so charming. <laughs> to, to wake up in a, with stone walls yeah, and, sure. and wooden beams and archways, mm-hmm. um, it, it, you know, and really beautiful gardens. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's different. Right. Um, I, you know, I, I want to be in a place where I could put a model in any corner or mm-hmm. I could just paint any corner and it would be beautiful. Right. Um, so for me... Florence was just beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the inspiration came from the fact that I was so focused on art and learning and mm-hmm. the excitement of the environment, the conversations I would have regularly with st- other students. Mm. I feel like I got more from students than teachers mm-hmm. uh, just be- because you interact with them so sure. much more often. Um, and the general excitement and dedication it was all it was all wrapped up into like this inspiration that i got mm-hmm. um it is true that i think you can get a lot out of anything if you if you look for it mm-hmm. um but there's certain aspects to europe that america just doesn't have mm-hmm. um and that's a lot of it is history and architecture for me for sure yeah um yeah so uh, i i think that Another thing that I'm really looking forward to is uh, interacting with artists that I admire and re- respect and love. Mm-hmm. And the last time I was out here, I just um, was sort of smacked in the face with how many friends I have out here. Mm-hmm. And it has been a common theme 
when I talk to these artists that they don't necessarily get together all that often, mm-hmm. um, which shocked me initially. Until you know, I but I have five kids. I know it's hard to get out, and mm-hmm. you, you have stuff to do and deadlines, and you got to constantly be at the at the easel working. Mm-hmm. But I think that's one thing that I I want to make a point of, no matter where I go, is to cultivate be the one be the glue if mm-hmm. if i need to be yeah um, be the one that is constantly reaching out and annoying people for their time <laughs> uh because i have this running theory and i've probably shared it on other podcasts before but i'll share it again um i have this running theory that the art that i see in museums that i res- that resonates with me the most mm. is most likely done by committee. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is that there were multiple eyes looking at it and and uh, a lot of critical feedback from a lot of different artists that went into finalizing that work. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason I say that is because I've read a lot of biographies that talk about how constantly these artists would hang out Mm -hmm. and interact and visit one another's studios and offer that critical Mm -hmm. feedback um and we don't do that it's Mm -hmm. not in our culture Mm, as much anymore Mm -mm. and i well culture in general not that's what you mean yeah yeah Mm -hmm. uh and i and so i feel like i could be better if i if i ran my Um, paintings you know throughout the process from concept to finality Mm -hmm. if I ran each step through the eyes of people that are great Mm -hmm. um, I think they could point things out that maybe I missed I think they could uh, um, you know open my mind to to things I hadn't considered Mm -hmm. which would make make the idea more full yeah Um, and I and I think that I want to get to that point desperately Mm -hmm. Uh, and I can't do it alone. Right. So, and it's diff- it's weird because I talked to like say Travis Schlott. Mm-hmm. We we had this painting retreat last October in Zion, and uh, and the way that he paints is so personal. And you know the way you know where he gets inspiration and how he comes, how he decides what to paint and how he chooses to approach the, mm-hmm. you know from a technical standpoint. It, to me feels almost like like Miles Davis you uh-huh. know it's like this really uh interpretive uh jazz like um choreography in the mm-hmm. moment mm-hmm. you know so i don't know that he would necessarily benefit from the same feedback that i'm looking for do you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. um uh, the, he's he's Im- improvising so on the fly right that I don't know that the feedback that I that I'm desperate for would land in the same way with him. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, I'm more I... calculated. I'm more. I want to have an idea and think about every single. Why is she wearing this? And why is it yeah. have this certain lighting? And why would I have her hands placed this way? Mm-hmm. And on and on and on. Um, and I think he's just far more jazz like. Mm-hmm. But don't you feel like the the feedback would be it would just be different, you know? It's like yeah, you sure. like let's say you and him were talking and you might be trying to give him that kind of feedback uh-huh. and he would just be like not the kind of feedback I'm looking for, man. Like this but doesn't make any sense to me, but extrapolate then extrapolate something from it, right? Definitely. And yeah. it would cause you to pivot in what you're asking him mm-hmm. and then he'll pull something from that and then it'll just just that well, the jazz you're talking about, it'll inspire you to think about something differently on yeah. your own. Like, well, actually, maybe it really doesn't matter yeah. what I'm doing here. Completely. And, uh, yeah. Uh, when I went to, so I'm, I'm trying to put together a TV show um, for anyone that might want to help fund it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we filmed about a third of a season and, and we were in Paris in uh, 2021. And... Um, talking to him and his wife, Kate, Mm -hmm. and uh, Sebastian Jupil. And it was such an expanding experience for Mm. me uh, because I think they're all very interpretive. I think they're all very uh, intuitive painters. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something that I I certainly could could have more of in my work, Mm -hmm. a a lot more freedom. Mm -hmm. Um, I realized at that 
moment that I had shackles on me that I wasn't even aware of. Right. And uh, so absolutely what you're saying is true, that um, those conversations are beneficial both ways and could definitely expand my, my way of thinking and, mm-hmm. and uh, open up new worlds to me in terms of how I might want to describe something visually. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, 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 the, I just want to surround myself with people that, that can do that for me because I think I could be better than I am. Mm-hmm. And I know that I can't do it by myself. Right. Uh, I shut my school down last January, so it's been a little over a year now. And I'm in a funk. I am, I am just, uh, I, I realize like even the students had a great impact on me, mm-hmm. um, just their presence and the conversations I would have with them um, were very impactful. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm in a spare bedroom, uh, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Right. You know, mm-hmm. I am just, uh, I am not particularly gifted in this uh, in this world uh, of art i think um i i went this direction not because i had a talent for it just because i had a love for it Mm -hmm. right and i've met talented people Mm -hmm. i'm not one of them and i'm okay with that i've come to terms with it i mean (laughs) i wish it were different it's not but i i love it so much that i want and I'm so committed that I want to at least pull out of myself as much as I possibly mm-hmm, can right? and work within the parameters that I have, but um, push those boundaries as much as possible. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm, I think I require uh, the expertise and talent of others mm-hmm. to lift me up out of myself. Honestly, I think everybody does though, at, at all levels, you, you, it's extremely valuable to always be around people. Like you, you don't want to, um, you just, you don't want to end up totally on your own convincing yourself that you're doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, before you know it, you look at something, you know, like how Google has those like memories that'll pop up now. It's like, I mean, Google's going to send you a memory from like five years ago. It's going to be one of your paintings. And you're like, wow, that's great. And then you're going to look around your studio and be like, oh, my God, <laughs> this is terrible what I'm doing. Yeah. Like, you're just going to get worse. Like, if you're not like actively challenging yourself and talking to people and seeing the different ways that people are thinking, I mean, you're just going to you're going to get shut off from everything yeah. and you're your work's going to suffer for yeah. sure. Everything will your brain will atrophy. Yeah, it becomes an echo chamber. And I've kind of fallen into that in the in the past few months. It's it's frustrating because I went from like inc- incredible inspiration coming home from Paris, and then mm-hmm. I went to uh, came to New York, and I get to talk to a bunch of people, hey Soon Song and and Patricia Watwood and and um, oh Peter Trippi and mm-hmm. uh, Max Ginsburg, and and I went home with it again like this uh, really a- expanded way of thinking, mm-hmm. um, and then. I sh- shut my school down <laughs> mm-hmm. and then I was alone and it just slowly started to decay. Right. And I, and I wasn't even aware that it was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's become more apparent. I, I moved out of my studio in November, um, which was a massive undertaking and move and life change. And now I wake up, I put my slippers on and I shuffle over to my, spare bedroom like an old retired man (laughs) and it's just me in the kitchen and the snacks and the kids yeah yeah (laughs) Uh, and so um yeah i i have realized like it's a fragile thing that the where you get your inspiration and your um it's a very perishable skill Mm -hmm. that that we have and um and it can go quick Mm -hmm. and and i've I'm in, I'm in the middle of that. Yeah. So, Bizarrely quick. A little yeah. Down. So, uh, yeah, it's like, like I stopped doing CrossFit for three months mm-hmm. and I have to start over completely. And that's mm-hmm. where I feel like I'm at artistically mm-hmm. is should I maybe sign up for the Lyme Academy and do the first year again or right, something, right? right? <laughs> can, can I put some electricity back mm-hmm. into my body and, and get get this heart beating again well, that's why you gotta move out here and then you go to uh art students league I yeah mean, that'll give you a huge jump start because you're gonna be i mean all that community you're looking for and all like the different ways of thinking and yeah. like you're gonna get that in yeah. spades there yeah well even even just sitting down and and talking to people and visiting mm-hmm. their studios and uh, uh i mean it's really 
why I want to keep doing the the podcast mm-hmm. because it 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 gives me a really good excuse mm-hmm. to bug people right <laughs> and and you know go in their in their places yeah and it's good for them too because they can dress themselves yeah <laughs> I mean my studio's right across the way and um, you're shuffling to your other room and I'm just in my pajamas that may or may not be stained in something <laughs> just over there and I remain in that four days. All day. No, not all not day, all days. days. <laughs> like I can go without dressing myself and feel pretty good about it. Like thankfully, yes, I'm close to the city. So it'll be like, oh good, I'm gonna see somebody. And you just like put your pants on. You're like, man, these are harder to put on than I thought. It's like dressing yourself is a challenge. So yeah, um, it, it's hard. It's yeah. real hard. <laughs> well, again, I think if uh, no matter where I go, I want to be that that mosquito that just keeps bugging people. Keeps um, telling artists to put their pants on. That's yeah, where you want to be. yeah, um, yeah. I think I think academically, I was really uh, I was all in on education because I. You know, I I went through the university system and it, you know, didn't benefit me all that much. Mm -hmm. And, um, and seeing the efficiency of, uh, the way the Florence Academy explained information Mm -hmm. and and how effective it was, Mm -hmm. I was so excited to share that just from a, um, uh, as a, it was a really pure, like, you guys got to see this. Mm -hmm. You guys could all be amazing. Um, because it's so understandable. Right. I was so excited to share it. I came back and, and Utah was just a desert of, of uh, um, artistic education information. Mm-hmm. And I had I felt like I came back with this box of flashlights that I could start handing out, right? right. It wasn't my information. It was just it was just information. Mm-hmm. And I was so lucky to have gotten it. And uh, there was there's actually quite a bit of pushback. And I dug in very arrogantly mm-hmm. uh, in Utah, and and it mattered so it mattered so much to me that I it, I lost sleep over it. Right. It mattered too much, mm-hmm. um, and I I built up walls and probably um, burned a lot of bridges just because I was so deeply firm in my stance that that students need this. Right. And um, and so. I'd like to I'd like to get a fresh start and not, you know, move to a place where I haven't made everybody upset (laughs) and try try not to uh, make people upset in a new place. But why do you think they found it so upsetting? They didn't like how regiment like did they feel like little robots trying to do this thing? I think at first um, there was a misunderstanding about what it was. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that there was a perception that it was very cold and it made you a robot and it didn't allow for any uh individuality Mm -hmm. which i understand Mm -hmm. um when you when everybody's drawing a figure Mm -hmm. and the figure looks like the figure everybody's drawings are going to look the same Mm -hmm. right so from the outside not having had that experience i could see how they could misinterpret that as a lack of individuality that started it the frustration for me was that they would push back based on this lack of experience and mm-hmm. so they wouldn't look into it mm-hmm. um, or try to understand it um, because they already had developed a perception that was in- inaccurate mm-hmm. and then they would denigrate it mm-hmm. and it and and so I felt like a lot of people were taking otherwise sincere students who were searching for a thing mm-hmm. this thing mm-hmm. that could make that could open up their potential faster and better than any other opportunities Mm -hmm. educational opportunities out there and they were telling them that that was a bad idea don't do that Mm. and um and i and so i felt like there was this undercurrent of pushback that shut down the opportunity to find out really what it was Mm -hmm. for really sincere students right and that really pissed me off Mm -hmm. because I was one of those right and if I would have heard something negative about the Florence Academy before I heard something positive I don't know if I would have looked into it right and if I wouldn't have looked into it 
I would not be an artist today. Mm -hmm. it, I, I would have been a total burnout, mm -hmm. you know, a, a hack uh, left to my own devices. I never would have learned what I learned. It's not information I could have discovered on my own. And some artists do, mm. right? I mean, I know uh, artists that don't have an academic education that are fantastic. Right. I just wasn't one of those. And the majority of people aren't mm. those. So when, when I saw that undercurrent of narrative shutting it down, I just got really upset yeah. and immaturely. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I felt like they were attacking something that was sacred. Right. And so I, I kind of bit back mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Well, it's understandable because there is, there is value in it for sure. I yeah. mean, clearly, you know, I mean, I went to Florence Academy and, um, I see, I see a tremendous value in it. And I think it's just a shame when, um, people always feel like they have to pick sides about something yeah. and, um, they'll either hear something and say okay well then that's not for me and my friends yeah. aren't doing this so it's it's not the place to go or or they misunderstand it completely just on their own and just independently and then they they don't go because they just don't get it and then you're just sitting there just being like no but it's like pretty good and yeah. then you're like but you're missing it and yeah. i think that there's a lot of different ways to get your education um all of which are valid, um, especially if you are extremely smart about your entire process, yeah. like eyes wide open or as open as they can be, like really trying to understand what, what it is that you're searching for. And I feel like even if a lot of students will land in Florence Academy, um, their eyes aren't like open. It's not sure. like they just like fell backwards into this amazing thing and yeah. then it's just going to work out. Like uh, chances are high it won't yeah, work it's out. Yeah, it's not a lottery. Right. It's, a, it's you still have to find your way. And 100%. It, and I think that that's like where uh, things will start falling apart is that um, they do this and they don't realize that a school light, like an atelier system is basically, it's just nothing more than uh, like homework mm -hmm. and a foundational training yeah. um, that you need to now do something with. Right. And it's the doing that nobody sees coming. They're like, right. oh, I thought I was just doing this. Yep. And then they're shocked when nobody wants it. And it's like, well, it, nobody's saying your figure drawing's not good. It's probably exceptional and better than what most people can do. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that that's what people are going to want to And it's not, buy, like, it's not art. Right. And I, I, I've been talking a lot about this is actually one of the reasons uh, that I shut the school down was um, I, f I realized very clearly that the atelier system, the academic system, whatever you want to call it, is devoid of any artistic conversation. Mm -hmm. They never talk about the post-application the post-graduation application of the skills. Mm -hmm. Everything is about skills. All, mm -hmm. the pr all the praise that you hear, all the adulation that you hear as a student is all based on who rendered this the best totally. and who has the most form and whose drawing is the best, blah, blah, blah. The best meaning accurate, right. whatever that means. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, we know what it means as a student, mm -hmm. but it means something completely different when you're talking in artistic terms. Mm -hmm. And I think that the academy that's it's the biggest fault of the academic system mm -hmm. is that they never discuss art right and so m the majority of students that go through these systems adopt the study as the art mm -hmm. and um and that can be very handicapping in a very similar way as if you don't get that education not drawing well is a mm -hmm. handicap right? right um so i i think that the the best you can do is if you want to get your skills as efficiently as possible mm -hmm. like at a, at a, you know develop those to a very high level the academic system is probably the best option out there mm -hmm. but the advice that i was trying to give my students for a number of years was while you're doing it constantly be making your own paintings mm -hmm. outside of class right because you have to simultaneously you don't have to but it's far more efficient if you're simultaneously mm -hmm. developing this artistic vision mm -hmm. while you're developing the skills. Um, if you're interested in art, not just yeah, technique. Absolutely. Yep. If, if you really 
are hoping to be an artist and create great mm -hmm. art, that takes way longer than the development totally. of skills. Yeah. So you can't put that off. A lot of my students would say, you know, I'm not good, have the, the trepidation of not being good enough yet, or maybe they don't have any ideas yet, or they feel like they don't have any ideas, mm -hmm. or they're not really sure how they would go about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, there's inevitability. The inevitability is that you have to be clumsy at mm -hmm. anything you want to do. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to suck in order to get good. Mm -hmm. And so there's no system that's going to help you avoid the clumsiness. Right. And well, it's also the best thing for you, honestly, yeah. to go through that. Uh, I'm, I'm just sort of like, I totally agree. And I'm sort of smiling because I was just listening to this Alan Watts lecture. I don't know if you know Alan Watts, but um, I know the name. Oh. He's, um, I guess, sort of like a like a philosopher, basically, um, like Zen, uh, Buddhist, like a Asian studies kind of professor. And um, he was talking, um, it, it was a Buddhist lecture he was giving, but uh, specifically he was referencing um, just how at some point he had this piano teacher and the piano teacher just basically told him, um, to be great, like, cause he had a bit more of like what we had, like a bit of an academic training in piano playing. Mm -hmm. Um, and that didn't really work out so well for him. Not that he was ever aspiring to be a pianist, but like he just abandoned it. And it, he just felt like he didn't really learn anything from that academic education. It was very taxing on him. He didn't like it. Then he had this other teacher who was just sort of telling him like, just, drop your hands on the piano just drop them and like let your hands just play some notes they don't have to be the right notes just play something put your hands down the gravity will do the rest and then it moved into that where it was just like sloppy like banging and then he said that it was sort of just looking at some uh notes and realizing that he had this block against understanding how to read the music that was a whole like trauma from like mm -hmm. academic learning that he had to get over or in the process of getting over that he's reading these notes and he was very worried about the mistakes he was going to make this sure. is like the sloppiness and that was actually why he couldn't read the notes was because he anticipated the mistake and then didn't want to make it so he would start and stop and then Eventually, he kind of got over that and was able to like, read the music a little bit better. And then he was still afraid to make the mistakes. And the teacher was saying, like, just make them. He's like, you're going to make the mistake. Keep keep making them and just keep yeah. playing the song. It doesn't need to be good. Let it be the worst song you've ever played. Just have fun with it and move through the song. Just get through the song. And he's like, this world opened to him, like, just through that sloppy terrible playing and he finally like understood how to play the piano like he got it it was like all i have to do is play with this thing yeah. play the piano and i'll get somewhere yeah. so it's like the sloppiness is like the best part it's like you just go through it it's like and you can't avoid it anyway yeah no you can't and so you just gotta embrace it do the worst paintings yeah like do terrible drawings, like get a sketchbook, do like the weird, creepy, terrible drawings you want to do. Yeah. And eventually it'll just turn into something like you'll yeah. realize through that play that what you're inspired by and your preferences and discover like weird ways that you like to compose things. It's like that's the discovery is just yeah. in that mess, not in the but the arm isn't rendered the yeah. way it's supposed to be rendered. And it's like, what does that even yeah. mean? <laughs> well, there's, there's two points to that that are really interesting. Um, one is, um, I think, something I hadn't really uh, maybe verbalized before, but you, you said it really well, um, that it's that, that, preemptive fear it's mm -hmm. the anticipation of the mistake mm -hmm. that um oftentimes i feel like with some of my students conversations i had with them it was so powerful and and when you study academically and and perfection is the goal mm -hmm. um that fear is amplified mm -hmm. because you've set such an unachievable standard for yourself uh and everybody around you seems to be doing it mm -hmm. right uh but it can be 
incredibly paralyzing to have such a high standard and then the expectation is so high that that you you anticipate that you're going to mess up mm-hmm. and and so you 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 it's like the yips in golf mm-hmm. or or something it's like yeah. it's like you 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 lose the fluidity uh, of the of the act yep. and i think that uh um that's a, a great point that you have to somehow have a high standard while accepting failure. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a very, very difficult dichotomy. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is that going through the clumsiness allows you to figure out how you want to say something, mm-hmm. right? Even if you're performing somebody else's musical piece or something, even if you're you know, doing a, a commissioned family portrait, uh, um, that you have to get right. It mm-hmm. has to look like the person. There's a way that you're that you are going to say it that nobody else could say it mm-hmm. if you find it. Right. And the only way to find it is by not copying a, a, a certain prescribed step one, step two, step three methodology that, that you could possibly pick up from an academy. Mm-hmm. Um, although that that's it's a very effective way to learn. Mm-hmm. It's it's someone else's solutions to right. a set of problems um, or by copying another another person the way that they paint stylistically mm-hmm. um, you can do that and learn faster mm-hmm. theoretically right uh, you can learn how somebody else does something faster because the solutions already laid mm-hmm. out for you but it's it's not a way to learn how you would describe it mm-hmm. um, and and although it's good to be influenced by a number of different uh, stylistic choices mm-hmm. Ultimately, you have to stumble over yourself to figure out how I want to say it. Right. And that's there's no quick path to that. Mm-hmm. And you have to be willing to suck. You yeah. have to be willing to to fall into it mm-hmm. rather than calcu- have this calculated path right. towards it. Um, I just don't know of anybody that has a really unique style that had a calculated path. Right. I think it just kind of... It's it's a part of you, and if you don't mm-hmm. release it, yeah, it's not even finding it. It's mm-hmm. just allowing the doors to open mm-hmm. and let it like fall out. Yes, um, rather than designing it in and, and shove, shoving it in there, right? And I yeah. feel like I've probably just tried to <laughs> say this. This is what it should look like. Yeah, and uh, totally. And, and I feel a bit stagnated as a result. I have this growing appreciation for for abstract art, and um, I don't know very much about it, um, uh, nor could I rattle off many names, um, but I do love it, I have to say. I really like abstract art, and um, being very representational and, you know, going through an atelier, you know, they, it's almost like it's not... I mean, I don't know if it's right to say that it's not encouraged, but being in an atelier, they they tell you basically like what to like and sure. abstract isn't going to be on the menu, no. you know? And No, that's on the yeah, it's you know. specifically not. Yeah, it's like that doesn't look like menu. anything. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's like, okay. Well, um but the reason why I bring it up is because like, cause you're talking about just like letting something out of you and uh, like letting it come from a really natural place. And that is just the essence of, of uh, abstract art. And I was recently explaining, um, somebody was saying they're like, I, I, I guess I like it, but I just like, don't really get it. It was very typical, um, like very expected conversation about abstract art. And I was like, well, I feel like, you know, when you have a dream at night, you'll experience that dream and you'll wake up. And for a minute, it's still very real. And then you're thinking about it and then you're just enjoying it. You know, you're just like, well, we're assuming we're having a good dream. And you're just like, wow, that was really fun or whatever it was, you just had a great time in this dream and it means something to you. It was what it amounts to. It meant something to you, this, this experience you had. 
The second that you decide to tell somebody about the dream, now granted, there's plenty of people who have no desire to hear about anyone's <laughs> dreams. I'm one of these people who actually weirdly likes to hear people's <laughs> dreams, but I'm well aware that no one likes to hear them. But like, the second that you decide, you're like, look, this one's good. I gotta tell you this dream. Even to you, it loses something yeah. because it's no longer in you, yeah. it's out. And I feel like abstract art is that dream state where it can be, the, the artist created it from within themselves and it's there, you don't really know what it means. They do, they're not explaining it to you. So you can interpret their dream. So mm. it's still something that came out, but it's not telling someone your dream. It's literally like pulling it out and placing it and letting it, bringing everybody into the dream, then pushing the dream out. Mm. And I feel like there's something really amazing about that that I don't want to say gets lost in representational work. I mean, that's what, what I do, you know, and, but there is something to that magic that I feel um, really exists well in an abstract state that lets people, it's like when you're doing a representational portrait, in my case, animals, humans, whatever, but there's always a little bit of it unfinished or sometimes some of it is unfinished. And it's almost like that's sort of our opportunity to let people fill in the gaps, yeah. the way that people will fill in the gaps with abstract art. Like the space between the notes. Yeah, it's like, as long as you're smart about the decisions you're making, the stuff that's left unfinished uh, is a little roadmap for people to be like, that's gonna go somewhere. And I feel like I know where that's gonna go. Yeah, And, uh, and at that point, the painting is destined to be a masterpiece because yeah. everyone's already on board with the painting. So they're going to look at that and they're going to imagine the best painting, but everybody's kind of imagining a different painting. And I feel like that's sort of that magic in representational yeah. where it's not finished and you're bringing everybody into your little dream where it's like, yeah. it can really be anything, you know? So it's kind of fun. Yeah. Camille Corey said, um, she was she was offering me some advice in like a, the softest way she, she could. She's so sweet, you know. <laughs> um, so she really sugarcoated it. But um, the message I think um, was in part: um, you don't have to describe everything because mm -hmm. I, I think I'm a little bit o overly verbose in my paintings, if mm -hmm. you want to call it that. Um, and she said you need to allow space for the participation of the viewer mm -hmm. and i think that a allowing certain things to be suggested mm -hmm. rather than fully explained mm -hmm. allows the viewer to fill in the gaps with their own experience yeah. their own understanding that um populates the painting mm -hmm. in a unique way that is unique to them right and uh it's it's interesting as you were as you were talking about that um i I have a, I have a different perspective. Uh, I think that, but I, I, but your perspective gives me more clarity on my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like when you talk about abstract art, I too am and I'm becoming or, or coming to appreciate parts of it more mm -hmm. um, in ways that I, a younger me, never would have thought right uh, was possible. Um, but I. I do feel like I still feel like and this will be controversial a controversial take but I still feel like art visual arts is a language and it is it it either speaks legibly or it doesn't mm -hmm. an abstract pure abstraction to me um, can have a, a strength of beauty that is unique to itself mm -hmm. um, but in a completely different way of communicating that is purely ethereal mm -hmm. there, there's no there's no clarity of message it, it might just be 
uh, it, it's like a, appreciating a pattern on a crumbling wall, mm-hmm. right? There's something about it that you think was interesting, mm-hmm. but it 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 doesn't necessarily say anything specific to you, um, which which maybe plays to your message of of that leaves everything wide open mm-hmm. to bring your own experience mm-hmm. to, um, which is a positive thing. Uh, but when I think about like. I, I dream in movie form. Mm-hmm. I dream with such clarity and linear quality that that I've written a lot of them down, and I think I got to make a screenplay out of this. <laughs> um, and so, when I want to describe a dream, I want to describe it in a way that Lermit would paint it. Or mm-hmm. do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I want to. I, I want to um, s- really have a clarity of message but i think the what i love about what you said is once you say it it's not in you it doesn't it doesn't you can't translate the experience of the dream to someone mm-hmm. even if you tell them the story of what it was what was happening mm-hmm. and i think that is in part in my mind because the dream has a, a fullness of um all of our perceptions mm-hmm. I- entangled with it mm-hmm. sound and movement and dialogue and uh, uh color and smells mm-hmm. and a- everything right mm-hmm. movies might be the closest art form that we can get to actually putting a dream on in front of somebody else right because mm-hmm. it has uh, the music and the acting and everything mm-hmm. and a dream is all encompassing it's like a, a life experience right and um so for me if i were to want to share a dream i'd want to share it almost in movie form right do you know what i'm saying uh-huh. because it, it it gives you the most of our of our perceptions mm-hmm. in, in one right um and uh but i I I don't know that I would jump to abstraction to, to do that. Right. Although the abstraction that I think is valid is what you're talking about is those spaces between the notes. Mm-hmm. It's it's allowing things to be unsaid. It's not describing every millimeter of of the of the idea. Mm-hmm. There's a great movie and again, I'm so repetitive on this stupid podcast. <laughs> but um um there's a great movie called Genius, mm-hmm. and it's Colin Firth plays an editor, and Jude Law plays Tom Wolfe, the, okay. the author. And uh, there's a you can YouTube this one part. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going through. Uh, Tom Wolfe brings in this these three thousand pages, just stacks of manuscript, mm-hmm. and uh, they just start reading it together. Mm-hmm. And and it's re- it's a really great movie. Um, it, it applies to us so much, um, but. Uh, Colin Firth is a genius editor because he says things, he gives feedback like you've said, you said that six pages ago, or this is repetitive, Mm -hmm. or I don't believe the way you're describing the thoughts of this character or whatever, but he allows Tom Wolfe, the artist Mm -hmm. to decide how he's going to pare it down, simplify it, what he's going to take out, Mm -hmm. um, and how he's going to say it more eloquently. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and there's a point at the end of this montage of the scene where they're going back and forth uh, talking about the manuscript. And uh, Tom Wolf, uh, Jude Law says, but the words, the words, I hate to lose the words. Right. And I, that's how I feel about my paintings. Like, yeah. I, I don't want to, like, delete that part of the painting. Uh-huh. I, I took so long to paint it. And, and, <laughs> but it's, it's so distracting and overstated mm-hmm. and, you know. Um, but the problem I have is I don't have an editor. Right. But again, that goes back to this this community that yeah. If 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 I could surround myself with people and get that constant feedback, yeah. Um, I could maybe realize a lot of these shortcomings. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I could I could sort of put the WD forty on those rusted latches and release mm-hmm. myself, release all this tension and anxiety I have with painting. Yeah. Um, and and get a little bit more of that fluidity back again. Mm-hmm. Um, in, insert, if you want to say, insert more abstraction, but mm-hmm. really just take out the the inconsequential is how I f- feel about it. Right. It's not necessarily inserting abstraction. 
it's allowing for it by taking out the inconsequential. Does, mm-hmm. it, does that make sense? Yeah, it definitely does. And this thing that I keep thinking about is the preciousness of every of everything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that... Mm, I don't know. I had like so. I had I had a lot of different thoughts while you were talking because I think that one. Let's just say the easiest way, quickest way to say it is that one art form I don't think is better than the other. And you could be one day you yourself are going to do an abstract painting, and then you're going to do some kind of illustration another day, and some photorealistic representation another day. Yeah. Like they're all great. Yeah. But it, I think it depends on like what it is that you're trying to um, get out at the moment, right. you know, and, and how that's going to manifest. And so there's that. But I was also thinking about like you're talking and like I, I feel so well this preciousness and excitement you have for what you want to create. And I think that that's really fun like I think that you have a real passion for any image that you're gonna make and I think that that's really wonderful and I think like what it is is it's it is it's like it's this intense love that's creating this kind of like clenched fist around (laughs) every image because you're like but all of it is good yeah. all of it is good yeah. you know and it'll kind of you'll get like defensive about it you know where it's like but this can't go because yeah, yeah. And you're like i but because because but like i did this and it looks great <laughs> and you're just like but it it doesn't really work yeah. though yeah you know but you don't want to get rid of it you know yeah. and it's like but think about that like with like so it's like it's wonderful and it's so exciting because everybody can relate to that it's like you just you want it all out there and you want people to see it and you just you're proud of it you want everybody to be proud of it you're just super excited like everybody's just excited to be here it's like i feel that from what you're saying um but at at the same time it's like it would be great to just sort of release the clenched fist a little bit because it's like everybody it's almost like i wonder if it's almost like not that it is, because I don't think that it's necessarily a fear for you. But for some people, when you get really excited about something, it's almost like this fear of like, but if that goes, people aren't going to know that I can do yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but it's like, but it's OK, because the image as a whole needs to be good. And we want to be able to breathe when we look at it. And yeah. we trust that even though we can't see this, we know, you know. Yeah. We all know. And it just lets it relax a little bit. And yeah. I think through that relaxing, it invites a lot more people in. Yeah. You know, so it's like it's fun because or it's funny because it's like I feel that excitement from you like when you're when you're speaking, like what you want to get out. Um, but at the same time, it's like, oh, if you could just release that yeah. a little bit, you'll feel better and it's going to you're going to relax and you're going to be like, oh man, that didn't need to be there at all. Yeah. You know? And I think it's, it, it, I also have to remind myself that um, it's in the, it's in the flaws that we, uh, that perfection exists. Mm-hmm. I, I had, I had this ongoing, it, it became a sort of irritant for my dad <laughs> because um, <laughs> as I was sort of like, moving away from a religion, um, I, I would have all these philosophical thoughts come up and, and it, certainly there were challenges to my religious upbringing, but I didn't necessarily see them as, as challenges as much as a different way of thinking. Mm-hmm. And, um, and one of the thoughts I had was, you know, there's this idea that God is all knowing and omnipotent and all powerful and per- perfect. He is mm-hmm. the, he is perfect. Um, but then in, in Mormonism specifically, there's, there's this concept of eternal progression. Mm-hmm. And so my challenge was, 
if eternal progression is a true principle, then that would mean that God is imperfect because perfection is a fullness of everything. Mm -hmm. It's a fullness of knowledge. It's a fullness of, of everything. Mm -hmm. And if you have that, you can no longer progress. You can't get any more. Right. Um, and so in order for God to be perfect, he has to be imperfect mm -hmm. because he has to still learn. He has to still improve. Mm -hmm. And, I, and um, it's a really interesting philosophical thought for me. I don't know how anyone, I don't know how the five listeners of this <laughs> would think about that. But uh, I, it, it's interesting to me because it's a good reminder that it's like the matrix, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever watched that, but mm -hmm. um, when, when he meets the designer of the matrix, mm -hmm. he talks about uh, when he first created it, he created this perfect world and nobody believed it. It, mm -hmm. it failed miserably. Right. And he had to, he had to have suffering mm -hmm. in order for it to be believable in order for people to buy in. Right. And painting is no different. You, it, it, a perfect painting has imperfections everywhere mm -hmm. and if it didn't have them it mm -hmm. would be uninteresting mm -hmm. and and i think that's the abstraction the this the, whatever terms that mm -hmm. you want to use uh abstraction or suggestion or uh things left uh, uh maybe unfinished mm -hmm. or vignettes or i mean whatever yeah. terminology you want to use there's a million different ways you can uh design that in there but it's it's allowing for something that shows the human aspect of what we're doing mm -hmm. right oh, yeah. and and i think that it's really interesting now because we're coming up against ai mm -hmm. which is amazing some right. of the the images that it's producing and um the the potential usage for that I, i've heard some artists talk about uh i mean there is some weirdness with copyright infringement i know like it's it's kind of scouring the internet for all these images right. and there's a lot of like artists work that's being kind of modified slightly right. by this yeah. ai but um so there's some there's some drawbacks to it but there's some amazing things being done with mm -hmm. it and i think that if anything it makes what we do even more valuable mm -hmm. because the the hand the human hand mm -hmm. including the flaws including the imperfections mm -hmm. is what makes what we do so amazing yeah. right mm -hmm. um i mean no one runs a perfect 100 yard dash mm -hmm. right a really great shooter in the nba shoots 42 percent behind the three-point line right. do you know what i'm saying uh, yeah you make 30 million dollars a year if you can make 42 percent of your shots <laughs> Uh, yeah, there, there's something amazing about knowing that mm -hmm. perfection is unattainable. Right. And and watching well, people try and achieve closer than yeah. most people mm -hmm. and and but still having such a massive chasm yep. between that and perfection. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. it, it, but it's it's knowing that it's just never going to be achievable. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and perfection if it was, is boring. If it was achieved, it would be boring. Uh, yeah, it's it just completely boring. It's really uninteresting. Yeah, yeah I'll take a little bit more. Um, it, it's a really interesting concept, and so the difficulty is when you are um, sitting in your own studio and thank you. Mm -hmm. um, when you're sitting in your own studio and you ha uh, for me this is my own issue um i want to i think it's just a standard it's an unachievable standard mm -hmm. um i want to describe this thing so well mm -hmm. um i think it's for me an adjustment of what so well means mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like mm -hmm. i want to i want to retain the amount that i care about it i mm -hmm. want to retain the standard to which I hold myself, I just want to adjust my understanding of what greatness looks like right. in my terms. Mm -hmm. do, do you know what I'm saying? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I think you're, you're talking about something quite deep. It, it, it's a, it's a heavy thing that you're talking about because 
I think what you're searching for is what you actually want to create. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I keep thinking about um, just how many, like, to your point about imperfections and, you know, coming from an atelier uh, system, it's all about your ability to represent and render something perfectly. And you, yeah. you will get in trouble for something not looking exactly like that yeah. person or, you know, it's like, but I don't really know if that like pinky toe is like <laughs> in the right spot or the right yeah. size. And it's yeah. really throwing me off. And right. it's, okay. <laughs> um, and, and I do think there's a place for that early on. Early on. Because you're just on, trying to train your eye, right? You're 100%. Just, 100%. Yeah. I, I'm so on board with that. That's like, you want that foundation. It's like, I, I think I'm, I'm a pretty, yeah, I, I, I always feel like there's exceptions to anything. So I believe that. But for me, I feel like you want to have the foundation to be able to deconstruct that and manipulate that. It's like, Otherwise, there's nothing to manipulate. If you never knew what you were manipulating, it's like you're just like sure. feeling around in the dark. Yeah. So it's like that's where you'll get an expert piece yeah. that it's like, well, that doesn't it's like that's where you'll get a piece where it's like that doesn't look right, but that totally works. Yeah. Why? And it's like, well, because they knew what they were doing. Right. That's why. And you're not going to know what you were doing unless, yeah. you know, unless it's you knowing had the foundation. exactly how you how to do it. Mm hmm you know, as perfectly as you can so that when you do it slightly differently, mm -hmm. stylistically, maybe you make a, a, a purposeful stylistic right. choice. That's the key is it's, it's done deliberately. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to work yeah. because it still works within the parameters of visual mm -hmm. uh, um, reality. Yeah. You just fucked it up a little bit. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. But, but in a way that is so much more interesting, mm -hmm. artistically credible, right. right? You've given it uh, artistic credibility within the realm of visual legibility. Right, completely, yep. And I, and I, it's like, that feels like what you're on the hunt for. It's like, yeah. well, how, great, but like, how do I do that? And it's like, well, and, I, Yeah, what does it mean to me? Yeah, what exactly. Do, what do my paintings look like mm -hmm. uh, um, with that thought in mind? Yep. For sure. Yeah. Uh, and it's an ongoing quest. Like, I don't think you're going to figure it out tomorrow or whenever. Like, yeah. it's literally like you're going to do something like that kind of worked. Yeah. And then you're going to do another one and be like, I guess that one's better. And then you're going to do one that feels like a major slide backwards. <laughs> sure. But like <laughs> that, but that's like that, like muck we're talking about. It's like, yeah. that's, that's what you want to play around in. It's, yeah. it's like, I had a great day today and a terrible day for like, day that was a year it's yeah, just like yeah. it's all bad but it's like that's that's the stuff that's gonna get you somewhere you know and and it's it goes back to what we talked about earlier it's the the initial clumsiness you have to have mm -hmm. in order to find sort of your artistic voice it never goes away mm -hmm. it, it, it one thing will get less clumsy as you mm -hmm. get more efficient at it and another thing's gonna you're going to start on that next clumsy path. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, and if you're not terrified, if you're not frustrated, if you're not pissed off and excited and mm -hmm. just jazzed about it all at the same time, mm -hmm. you're probably not growing. Right. Right. Completely. Yep. Yeah. I'm I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the decay phase right now. I need to get back <laughs> to that. It's, uh, I, I need to get back to that sort of inspired place. Um, mm -hmm. I think travel is a big thing for me. I, yeah. I was talking to my wife about it, and um, that's just a big thing is getting out and talking to people and thinking differently and having enlivening conversations mm -hmm. and, and seeing cool places and going to museums. And it's right. it's like that, that sort of... Adderall shot of energy that's like like okay okay let me refocus yeah um, yeah I think that's really been a huge important thing for me so um, it's been nice to I mean already I just flew in mm -hmm. but everything that I've been missing for the last few months in you know in my slippers in my spare bedroom <laughs> I just you've just given me <laughs> so yeah thanks so much for hanging out yeah of let course. me let me visit yeah um so what are you 
working on now since since i've known you i think uh when we first met you were you were focused a little bit more uh on figurative work Mm -hmm. and you've um since had uh you've done a lot of work with with animals Mm -hmm. and carved out this amazing place for yourself in the (laughs) art world with um how what the cool things you're doing with that Mm -hmm. um I mean, you're an animal lover, though, right? Oh, I am, big time. <laughs> I'm a total sucker. I'll have mice in this house sometimes, and I'll save them and just be like... You name them? Basically, yeah. <laughs> Knit I mean, little sweaters? Yeah, I would. I honestly <laughs> would. I, I love everything. I'm seriously a total sucker for animals. Yeah. Yep. Bleeding heart for them. And, and so, what... Uh, to tell me about your career. Just tell me, like... What got you into that beyond just your general love for it? Um, what you're doing now and, and where you think you're headed? <laughs> I have no idea where I'm headed. <laughs> um, but like, so it started um, because I was doing so much figurative work. And, uh, you know, I my studio was separate from my apartment in the city. And uh, I... Uh, you're, that's right. You were living in New York, right? I was, yeah. In Manhattan? Yep, I okay. was there. Um, and then I had a studio um, in in Greenpoint. Okay. So uh, so that's Brooklyn. And uh, I, uh, I, you know, like by the time you get home, it's like you'd work the whole day because I, I don't take a lot of breaks, if any. It's like if I go, I'm there and I am painting and then I leave. The, yeah. I, I don't do a in and out kind of thing. So like at the end of the day, I'd be really tired, but like, okay, this is the time to go home. And I'd get home and, you know, I'd be exhausted. And then it sort of turned into this thing where it's like, oh, I just needed a glass of water or, oh, I just <laughs> needed a sandwich. And I'm like, I was like ready to go. And, and so I decided one day to like take some paints home with me. I was like, well, maybe I'll just do like a little painting. And yeah. I was like, well, I don't want to really want it to be a person because, like, I do that all the time. And it turned into be, uh, I did a, a, a hairless cat for fun. And I was like, and the reason for it was because I was like, well, I want it to be an animal. And if it's a hairless cat, that's a lot like the skin on a person I'm painting. So it's yeah. not that much of a departure. So I guess I'll just do that. And, um, it literally is almost as easy to say as like the rest is history. Like yeah. I did it and I posted it online. Someone asked to buy it. I was like, okay, well, I guess that's gone. I should do another one. Yeah. And then somebody asked to buy that one. Wow. And it really just snowballed. Um, yeah. And it wasn't what it is now. Um, like, cause now I'm doing a, a commission a day. Like, it's just wow. like endless good good endless like i'm not complaining like i'm so happy like to get the work but like i'm happy to hear from people too because it's it's never just here's my animal painted like you get a little story their story their story with the animal the animal story and you read it all and it's like beautiful and i feel amazing being engaged with that like getting to paint them and for these people and Um, but like it took some time to get there, but what was nice for me was that I didn't know this is where I was trying to get. So I was just painting for fun. And that snowball I was talking about just grew over maybe like four years where it was like, you start feeling like, oh, well, I guess this is like maybe a thing. And you start like running some numbers and you're like, well, if I do like three of these a month, that'll cover this sure. and I guess that's all I need which and is then, the practicality of what we do that is essential yeah you know I mean you can't avoid it totally I want it completely and then I just started doing more and I was like well that's good and and then you know cut to now which I I guess is maybe like nine years or so I've been doing this eight I don't even know yeah <laughs> um and it, and it is what it is now where it just, I, I like that organic growth. Like I think I would have been really stressed out if I knew that this is what I was chasing. Yeah. So the fact that it just sort of grew organically and um, it was a lot of word of mouth and um, 
you know, I, I use Instagram, so um, I have a, a good following on there. So people will inquire, like I'll post something and then it'll jog somebody's uh, thought, uh, mind to be like, oh, maybe this is a commission. So like a, a something else will come in. So yeah. at this point, it just sort of feels like a nice little machine that's running. Yeah. Um, and I uh, really love everything about that. And at the same time, it's like all consuming. Like I said, I do a commission a day. Wow. And um, that's crazy. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and is yeah, it stressful? I mean, it, I'm sure part, parts of it are, right? I don't find it stressful. Um, but what there's an element of it where because that's what I do. And it takes up almost, I've got to carve my own time out. Mm -hmm. And I'm realizing that within the last like year or so, it's like, oh no, you need your own time. Yeah, yeah. And that's hard to carve out because you you get into a rhythm and then you panic about certain things where it's like, but if I'm doing this, then is this going to suffer? And what does this mean if I do this? And um, then you start having conversations where it's like, but you're worth it and do the time, do what you want to do. Yeah. That's fine too. Like just allowing yourself some things. And I think that's sort of what I'm in the middle of figuring out right now where yeah. it's like, I know I need that time and I have some idea of what I want that time to be, but I'm so out of practice with yeah. what I actually want to create for myself. That it's like I'm baby stepping into it. Like yeah. right now I'm doing a big painting. Um, um, of a pig, so not much of a departure at all. But the theme is um, from the Odyssey uh, with Circe and her pigs, yeah. if you know that. Do you know that? I don't. Um, so it's, uh, there was just, I mean, she was basically like a footnote in the story. Somebody's written another book about her specifically. But she was like a, a blip in the story. But she, what she, Oh, you know that um, Waterhouse painting of a woman like this and she's holding a bowl mm-hmm. and it's like dripping some. So yeah. that's that's Circe. OK, um, so she I guess she's a popular theme um, and she was a witch in the Odyssey who um, Ulysses encountered. And he, when him and his men decided to leave, she didn't want them to leave. So she turned everybody into pigs. Okay. Um, and um, I just think that there's there's a great story there. Like, because she's, she's a little bit of a deeper character than just... I mean, that's the thing that happened, but there's more to it. And I like the more to it part than yeah. that. Like, her as um, uh, someone craving something from the outside world craving something from a person a group of people where they may not be able to provide that it's sort of like a loneliness kind of tale um tragic figure i'm a big fan of like tragic figures and um uh there I, i think there's some kind of like romance in that and um so my sorry my little um baby step towards what do i want to paint is well i've been painting animals forever i guess i'll do this pig with this theme so it's like it's getting those wheels like slowly turning you know or it's like these because that's what i'd always gravitate towards because i i also love stories and movies i i'm a big fan of like a strong narrative and great characters um and that's sort of what i think i'd like to eventually get back into is like maybe yeah just sort of pieces that are a little bit more um grand involved than just a solitary portrait yeah um because in a portrait the portraits i do um i don't mean to say just a portrait because it's like these animals especially people who share their stories i mean they they're they're big stories you know they they i like i said i mean it's like i i've got a bleeding heart for animals so like um you know i see so much in them and then i try to put that into the work i do um so i'm getting something very fulfilled there um but 
it's not the story I want to tell. Sure. Um, and that's what I'm trying to like carve some time out for. Yeah, that's that's interesting because I think that's part of what we were we were talking about earlier. You know, what I'm struggling for is is not only what do my paintings look like, but what matters mm-hmm. to me. What are the themes that that mean something to me, and and what how would I how would I depict that visually? Um, and it is true. What you say, I, I think there's a fulfillment when you um, get to work with a client who shares their stories and you get to give them something of yourself, uh, share your expertise in a way that is particularly meaningful to them and their narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a fulfillment to that that you don't get any other way. Uh, but there's, as an artist, there's something more mm-hmm. and, and to find that, um, it's that lifelong journey. Cause what matters to you now, uh, may not matter to you three years from now. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's an, there's an ongoing changing shift of, um, of themes that kind of ebb and flow from your life mm-hmm. and painting those in the moment, um, and being aware of them, being awake to them mm-hmm. is, is really important. Right. And then, and then like you say, allowing for them Mm -hmm. because you have to demand that time Mm -hmm. to to follow those yeah um if you don't i think there's a you're you're shutting off part of yourself that is probably maybe the battery Mm -hmm. uh, to what you do yeah right definitely yeah um you'll you'll i i agree completely um i'm just thinking about being um, weeks or months of nothing but commission work. And you don't even realize that you're feeling a certain way until you're like, well, maybe I'll just paint something for fun. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, for me right now, I'll I'll paint on that pig. And you just, it's just your decision and you go and you do it. And then you just feel great at the end of the day. (laughs) Right. And you're just like, oh, it's cause like, I did my painting. That's why I feel good. And, um, yeah, it really feeds your soul doing stuff like that. Like your work. Yeah. Um, I I think that's true in, in any aspect of life. I think if you're a mother and, and you put so much into, you know, kids, kids, kids Mm -hmm. and how, you know, taking care of sports and homework and all, Mm -hmm. all of that. And you don't take time for yourself. That can be, in, in the same way, very stifling. I think mm-hmm. uh, for me, um, sports has been a big part of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, just making sure that I, I'm active mm-hmm. and um, fulfilling these cert- these moments where where it's just self improvement, right? Yeah, and for sure. Not boy. I mean, whether it's self improvement or maybe it's just smoking some weed and reading a book, reading yeah, a book. Yeah. You know, in in you know outdoors or uh, i mean whatever yeah um it, it, being able to um allow yourself that time to uh be self introspective and mm-hmm. inquisitive and um it, it's really important because who you are is what you're able to put out mm-hmm. at, uh, for other people it's right. it's how it's what you bring to any other project mm-hmm. and if you deny that uh, for the sake of everyone else's ideas or needs, mm. um, consist too consistently, then then you lose that. I, right. I think. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. And I'm thinking about how um, you know you you've got this passion for for travel and uh, the kind of life experiences that 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 provides. Um, and you know you don't have to have travel for life experience, but. I think that the the concept of life experience is something that people don't really have anymore. Yeah. I I don't think people really experience much. Um, You know, it's like COVID aside, it's like, yeah, nobody was going anywhere. But like, even before COVID, it's like, I feel like there has been a lack of inspiration in a lot of people's lives. Like nobody really knows how to 
what they want and how to find it. Yeah. Um, and that um, lacking is, I think, something that's really contributing to some of the weird, well, um, well, bad art that's out there right now. Yeah. And, and it's bad not because, uh, you know, a skill isn't there or anything like that. It's it's bad because you're looking at it and you're just like, whoa, that's like really empty. Yeah. That's really empty. It's like something that looks like something that may have well have been shot with an iPhone because it's yeah. some kind of selfie or it's like, um, you know, me and my friends sitting on a couch or, um, I mean, I, w I don't even know what, but it's like everything just feels very empty right yeah. now. And I think it's been empty for a long time. And I think it's just because there's this richness to life that people uh, don't have, but I, I, it's like, they don't know they don't have it. And, but at the same time, there's like this emptiness inside yeah. of everybody. And it's like, everybody's just really confused and sad and then wonders why they can't come up with an idea for a painting. It's like, because you're not living, you haven't yeah. been living. There's, there's nothing inside of you to put on the canvas. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've seen it with my kids and I think it's, it's cultural. Um, I think it's be, it goes way beyond art. I think it's a it's interacting as human beings, and I, I've seen it in my kids because, you know, you and I are maybe the last generation that grew up knowing what it's like to not have a cell phone mm -hmm. and knowing what it's like to not have the internet. Right. Reading an encyclopedia to do a paper. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I, I you know we grew up outside and um, playing cops and robbers or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I think that kids are growing up now with devices and, and uh, uh, social media. And there's this sort of vapid uh, surface quality to our perception of life and success and popularity that we get from things that aren't real mm -hmm. from, from this very sort of shallow uh, conception of life. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're fed through these, uh, what, uh, um, headline, you oh, know, yeah. shortened mm -hmm. versions of a story. And we don't look in, into it any further. We don't go out and experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that, that probably lends itself to a shallowness um, because our interactions aren't as interactive yeah. as they used to be. Mm -hmm. um, we used to spend time together <laughs> yeah. and now we text. Mm -hmm. and now, I mean, if we, if you get a phone call rather than a text, you're just right. like, Jesus Christ, I know. do I ever have to answer this? I know. <laughs> uh, and this sort of thing is, is, enlivening mm -hmm. and, and um, I crave it because I'm familiar with it right but I'm I'm afraid that my kids might not have that familiarity right you know mm -hmm. um, I mean the things everybody wants to be famous now I know that's the goal I know um, yeah. they don't and, and I think that comes with art as well mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, there's ways to kind of get the algorithm to look at your, I your know. Instagram and point things towards what you're doing. And, and it takes a long time to make those videos and the yes. TikToks and whatever. Yeah. And the, the people that are invested in that do really well. Of yeah. course, they're grabbing the algorithmic attention, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know if they're making the, the best art and mm -hmm. I, and I don't know if they're making the best connections with people either. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, my concern is for my kids on a deeper level with with just the kind of human beings they're going to turn out to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I saw that my son was watching videos of other people playing video games, right. that blew my goddamn <laughs> mind. <laughs> That's when I knew humanity was doomed. <laughs> I could barely stand to play video games for yeah. more than two hours when right. I was young. 
let alone watching somebody else do it. Oh my gosh. But think about this though. Like this is just the different reality that we're living in because it's like I originally had the same reaction to that. But if you think about it, it's like you watch somebody play football. Yeah. It's literally the same thing, except it's digital. I guess because I you used could look to at play... it from a skill standpoint, maybe. Is that what you're saying? Because like when well, you watch somebody I... play football and you played football, right? you know how hard it is to throw a pass that accurately, or you know how quick that runner is. But or think you about know... the amount of people who play or who don't play and watch. Yeah, I'll watch football true. and I sure. never played. Yeah. I get destroyed if I played. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's, I, I really, I think it's, it's not some people it's where they can watch the skill and appreciate like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other people, they're just enjoying it. And it's like, you're watching a game that you're not playing. Oh and it's gosh, like, I, I never thought of it I that think way. it's the same thing, except it's just digital. So what you're saying is that me watching Sunday football is the same as my son watching. I don't like that at all. I don't like that thought at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, boy. I'm saying I think it's I think it's the same. I think it's weirdly the same. Yes. Oh boy, you've just crushed my whole point. Oh. I get it though. I get it. I I understand it. But but I think the uh that disconnect that the new digital world yeah, for um, sure. presents is is a very um strong deterrent to real interaction mm-hmm. and uh, a dangerous one mm-hmm. and, a, and i'm hopeful that um i mean f- just from a from a cultural standpoint altogether that that we find value uh and retain that value of personal inter- interaction mm-hmm. but especially as artists especially as artists mm-hmm. i think that um this goes back to you know what we've talked about kind of peppered throughout this conversation that um i think we make each other better oh completely Uh, yeah and and it it's it is too common in um a modern art artist in the modern artistic world that we and, and i think part of it comes from the this desperate need to feel to to create that individuality mm-hmm. um um to to make your own work to be your own person yeah um but i i really feel like the most important thing we could do um as artists and people is understand that we're so much better when we interact and work together mm-hmm. um, yeah. and it doesn't it doesn't diminish our individuality it amplifies it mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Well, and like taking time too. Yeah. like it's the community that matters. Um, and just time spent, like you're talking about how, how everybody wants to be famous and, you know, that's an expedited life. Yeah. Like, you know, you're in a hurry to get somewhere right. if that's what you're chasing. Number one, super dark nobody should be chasing fame it's uh going to lead nowhere and it's i i just i think chasing fame is a pretty dark path yeah um because what what is at the end of it isn't what you think and there's nothing at the it's not what you think and it's actually nothing (laughs) i'm I'm saying that pretty naively yeah i'm not famous no nor nor am i (laughs) So my assumption is yeah. that there's not much at the end of it. Mm, there's really not. I mean, like, look, again, I'm not famous either, but, like, just reading biographies and, like, you know, interviews with people, and it's just, like, I swear, every time, that, like, they'll say, ultimately, in one way or another, there's nothing here. Yeah. There's nothing here. And, or, and they almost crave anonymity yeah, to a certain degree for w- sure. when, they, when they reach a certain level of fame. Yep. But like when you're in the process of chasing this thing, not only are you going to be disillusioned, but like you're losing that, that creativity that we're talking about. There's no opportunity for yeah. it. It's not going to grow there. So it's like, yes, you need community. And that's why I was saying you need time to things need to you need to cultivate stuff. Yeah. That thing about life experience we were talking about, like, yeah, you got to like, just get out there and like, 
live a life, live a yeah. life that has nothing to do with art, gain the experience right. and cultivate something inside of you so that when you do sit down to work, there's actually something there. Yeah. I'm, in order to create something interesting, you have to be interesting. Yeah, right? definitely. In and to have something to they say. They want to skip it. They yeah. just, everybody wants to skip it. Yeah. I think it's easy to say, oh, the, the kids, <laughs> the kids want to skip it. These days. But like everyone wants yeah. to skip it. Like, I mean, you know, I'm sure we've got friends, peers, everyone. They just, it's like, oh, but can I just like go yeah. over here? It's like, no. Yeah, I guess yeah. you can, but it's like, it's not going to be good. Sure. And then they'll get upset when it's not good. It's like, yeah. well, but are you surprised? Because there's actually nothing in what you did there. Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, it's like, but it looks exactly the way it's supposed to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, well. <laughs> well, I, I used to, I, I, not used to, I, I, on and off have had this idea um, because I've wanted to talk to certain people like uh, Adam Duritz, the lead singer of Counting Crows. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was a massive fan and I've met him a couple of times in no way that he would ever remember me just uh -huh. as I was this passing fan. Um, but, uh, you know, I follow him on Instagram and I wrote him last time I was in New York and I was like, Hey, I have this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, you know, I'd love to come talk to you. Yeah. Of course he didn't write back. Uh, and it, it makes me think like, Oh, if I were, if I had a little bit more of a following or if a little bit larger voice, mm -hmm. which requires a little bit more, fame a little yeah. less anonymity maybe you know i could get a response from some of these people but the desperation isn't for the fame mm -hmm. it's for the opportunity to talk to really sure. interesting people yeah um that but i but i have that in the mm -hmm. art world i have like people like you that that um that i know well enough mm -hmm. that that um acquaintances or friends of friends or whatever that at least um i've exhibited in my own life, a certain level of understanding in my craft that allows for mutual respect to the point where we can sit down and talk. Right. right? Yeah. Um, and I think that if I can continue to do interesting things and continue to really dedicate to my craft and continue to do that, I'd rather the door be open to these people that I respect because they respect me back rather than because I have so many followers. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, like, yeah, for I'd sure. love to talk to Joe Rogan. Yeah, I'd yeah. love to talk to Sam Harris. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to talk to Christopher Hitchens if he were still alive. Oh, I know. But but I'd rather that that door be open to yeah. them because they liked what I did because yeah. they, you know, respected that I like kind of had this crazy dedication to a thing mm -hmm. and, and they wanted to find out about that as much as I wanted to find out about them. That's the way to do it. Yeah. That's yeah. how you want to grow anything is that like mutual respect and interest. You yeah. never want to be sitting there wondering if someone reached out to you just because, Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like, and fun things can happen that yeah. way, you know, and you're going to meet, and that's the message I want to give to my kids is Instead of being the famous person people want to talk to because you have two million followers, mm -hmm. be the interesting person someone wants to talk to because you have so much to say. Oh, yeah. For right. Sure. Because yeah. you have something to contribute. Mm -hmm. And that takes effort. Yeah, definitely. That, that takes a lot of effort and dedication mm -hmm. to life. Yeah, um, definitely. That, that the, uh, is it the Island Boys? I don't think they have. The it, what? What is it? The, these I don't know. These kids that are all tattooed up and they wear the grills and I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I think they're called the Island Boys. I don't think they have that dedication to life. I don't think they're interesting. They're just popular by right ridiculousness. Sure. Well, that's how. Right? That's a whole thing now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I'm thinking of right now is, um, look, everybody knows Dylan, and Dylan's great, right? Bob Dylan. Oh, of course. Yeah. We all love him. I love him. Uh, I have nothing bad to say about him. I love him just as much as anybody else does. Um, what I will say is there's this other person um, who, I don't know, maybe it would like in the last, at this point, it feels like I should have known who this person is, but I don't think a lot of people do. So I guess I shouldn't feel so bad. Within the last uh, few years, there's this other guy, Michael Hurley. Do you know Michael Hurley? Mm -mm. 
So Michael Hurley was, um, is, uh, is? Mm, uh, I don't know if he's still, no, I think he's still alive. Um, right there with Dylan. He was like in uh, Greenwich Village in the city, like playing with Dylan at, well, you know, at the same time. Sure. And again, not to take anything away from Dylan, it's not the intention or the point of the story, but like Michael Hurley um, uh, is amazing. Like his songs are super folky, um, an absolute delight to listen to. I have one of the records, we should play one later. Um, love this guy. I mean, like even like all of his album, co- it's like the songs are amazing. Yeah. Again, just a delight. His album covers are also a delight because he drew all of them and they're wow. just really weird. They're yeah. just really weird. I mean, nothing spectacular, but like to the point of just like art being art and it's like it doesn't have to be good. It's like yeah. it came from this guy and you're just like, yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's just like wolves driving a car. <laughs> okay, I'm yeah. on board. You know, like I love it. Like great. Every, the package is fantastic. The, the music is wonderful. And Michael had put out a song. He was record. He not did he record it? I'm not even sure. Um, anybody who actually knows this, I'm probably butchering the story. But he like he re- he was playing somewhere. Dylan heard it and was like, "I like that." And I don't remember which song it was, but it turned out to be one of his biggest ones that sort of set off his entire career. Yeah. Um. So it was like Dylan sort of almost got noticed because of a song Michael Hurley wrote wow. and, and that he stole from him. Yeah. And, you know, what's kind of nice about it is Michael Hurley's attitude about it. He's just like, yeah, man, they're just songs. I wrote one and he took one and it's like, yeah, whatever. And he's just sort of like this underdog out yeah. there who's just still doing his thing. He's got a great attitude. And it's like, that's I think just sort of what you want is like you yeah. just want good people around you just be like yeah man I'm just sharing it it's out there it's yeah. like don't steal from me but you did and that's all right and you're doing great and I'm doing great and it's kind of fun to just be around the underdog sometimes yeah, yeah. just be like I would wonder how like you'd almost want to be around a, a Michael Hurley more than a Bob Dylan yeah. like a lot of the times it's like it's not about the fame it's about somebody who has something great to offer and someone who's interesting yeah. and n- no yeah. one's saying Dylan's not interesting, but Dylan is a little bit closed off. And it's yeah. like, if you're going to hang out in a bar with somebody, it's going to be Michael. He's, I think, I think I do know who you're talking. Is he, is he Irish? No, mm. maybe not. Look, I, I don't know. I just know. watched a thing on Netflix with Dylan and I, and I thought maybe he was interviewed mm. for it. Well, maybe. I I don't think he is, but I could be wrong. Like, I know a lot of random information, but I don't necessarily know all (laughs) the things about it. Well, it's it's an interesting thought. It's something I think about all the time, actually, um, which is um, how much do you love something? How dedicated are you to it relative to the success that may or may not come from it Mm -hmm. right uh i I think you know we hear all of these um stories and and motivational speeches from people who have made it Mm -hmm. and if you're gonna read uh like here's how you do it book Mm -hmm. you want to do it you want to read it by the person who actually became successful financially yeah yeah um but what about the people who did it and did it and did it and for some reason never broke through to that sort of level of popularity that brought them mm-hmm. the financial windfall, mm-hmm. but they just kept doing amazing things mm-hmm. over their entire lives. Um, and I wonder how many people have the fortitude to continue to do something without that little bit of luck that mm-hmm. is required to break through to that that higher level of right. of whatever financial success, um, can, who who can hold on to this concept of success being relative to the quality of work you're producing mm. versus the monetary outcome? Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Um, it's something I, I I think about all the time um, that I struggle with because uh, you know maybe 
at times where you, you I might go three or four months without selling a painting and mm-hmm. I think like god damn am I just a hobbyist at this point yeah, yeah. I'm just a, this this kid who never grew up and I'm uh, you know I, I, when am I gonna get a real job <laughs> or whatever uh, and how much longer can I keep doing this and then and then I go I, I always go back to that that sort of pure mentality of it's bigger than me it's more yeah. important than me I've dedicated myself to this I've I remember Bob Dylan was uh, interviewed on 60 Minutes, and people people play it off as he was saying he sold his soul to the devil. But yeah. um, there's this moment where in the interview where he says, um, I'll get the quote wrong, but he, he says, I, I made a deal. I yep. made a bargain. Yep, yep. And, um, and he says, oh, well, can I ask who you made a bargain with? Mm. And he's like the... The guy in charge, you know, or whatever. Well, I don't know yes, exactly I know the terminology. Exactly. Yep. But the bargain is, is like I'm dedicating to this thing that's bigger than me. To mm-hmm. me, that's what I heard him saying. Yeah, yeah. It's not like I bargained with the devil or bargained with God. Right. It's I bargained with this thing that I dedicated my life to. Uh-huh. I promised the thing. Right. The art mm-hmm. that I would give everything I could mm-hmm. to, to doing it as well as I could. Mm-hmm. And... And that's the purity I always go back to mm-hmm. is, you know, I, I committed mm-hmm. when I was 26. Right. And the, whatever happens in the world that brings a certain popularity or, or sellability or, or whatever finances are involved with this, mm-hmm. I have to... I mean, I'm a father of five. I have to be responsible. Right. Um, I have to pay the bills. I, mm. I, tr- I, I'm, I'm balanced. I'm juggling those two balls. You yeah. know, the the financial fiscal responsibility with the artistic responsibility. But mm. the thing I committed to first was the art, mm-hmm. and I have to, I have to be all in on that. Mm-hmm. You know, popularity, yeah. no popularity, selling, no selling. Mm-hmm. I have to come back to the fact that that that's more important than, mm-hmm. than me. And the minute that you deviate it, you're you're gonna you're not gonna feel good. You're gonna know that you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. For and you, and you always make worse work. It nothing Definitely. good comes from that. Yeah. Well, I think that nothing good comes from deviating from the original intention. Yeah. Because it's like you could embark on something where like all anybody really wants is somebody to be honest about what they're doing. Yeah. It's like you know why you set off on it and you set off on a very similar path that I did. Um and I think then there's other people who are like, "No, I'm just in it for the fame." And it's like, you know, that might not be something I enjoy maybe on a certain day something I don't really respect but you kind of do need to respect it because it's like no they're being honest like yeah there's n- no tricks being played on you or them they're like no I I want this and they're on a clear path for yeah. it and you're gonna get that kind of results from it yeah. you may not like it and honestly they might not like it either but that's not the point they right. want the fame. So they are right on track for what they want. Yeah. So it's like that kind of consistency is going to get you the result you want. And yeah. the second you start deviating from that is where you're going to just like, you know, hit little speed bumps or yeah. like completely derail yourself where you're just like, no, I'm doing this for pure reasons or yeah. whatever. And then you're, you start getting worried about finances and you're like, no, I should do it for the money. And then you're doing it for the money. And then all of a sudden you're just like, well, I don't know why the work's no good. And it's like, well, cause you're not built for it. That's why the work's no good. Your heart's not in it. It's like, you're not the guy who wanted it for the fame or the money. Yeah. You're literally not built for that. So what do you expect? And it, it, it can be an imbalance as well. Right. Because, you know, part, part of me says, if nobody knows who I am, mm. they're not going to buy the work. Mm-hmm. Their anonymity is 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 a killer to some degree, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't. We're doing something that is meant for public consumption. Mm-hmm. So if the public is never aware of it, mm-hmm. they can't consume it. Right. So I think that there is there is a necessary reality that what we do has to have some promotion behind it. it has mm-hmm. to have some sort of visibility. Right. Um, and so 
you know, social media or whatever, how, whatever platforms you're using to get it out there and share it are necessary because it's meant to be shared. Mm. Um, and then if, if you are relying on it as your income, then you have the response. You've, you've accepted that sort of peripheral responsibility of, mm. of, of monetizing it. So yeah. how do you, you have to, you have to solve that problem. It's another problem to be solved. Yeah. Um, and and the where it goes awry is when it the imbalance is, is or uh, shows itself or, mm-hmm. or when the balance is lost when when the art suffers for the promotion or or um um you start painting for um to try and win an award or, right. or whatever yeah uh or or the imbalance is offset the other way where you're mm-hmm. doing something that's so personal that it 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 doesn't you know nobody it doesn't find an audience because it's so deeply personal yeah and you have to do that right i mean but but the difficulty is in balancing the two Uh worlds yeah completely Um, and i think it's an interesting it's another interesting part of the conversation we probably don't have time to get into (laughs) we've been going i don't know what time it is but um I, I, you know, just balancing the responsibility of, of monetizing what you do. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Mm-hmm. I, I, w- I would like to get to a point where I don't have to sell paintings, um, where I could just give them away, where I could just yeah. make them f- out of just, this is, this is what's in me uh-huh. uh, and, and then just give them to people. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the monetization of, of this is maybe the thing I hate the most mm-hmm. about what I do. Um, I talked to a little bit to Howard Ray's about that Ray's, mm-hmm. uh, of Ray's galleries, and he says he always advises his artists to have a job, yeah, to right. not have to monetize <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, for I, sure. And I, uh, I pushed against that early in my career. Um, I thought I didn't want to give myself any backup option. I, I was going to be all in on this. Mm-hmm. For my personality, I had to do that. If mm-hmm. I was working 40 hours a week, I never would have came home and painted. Right. Um, but uh, I think there's something to making art without the um, the weight mm-hmm. of needing to monetize it. Yeah. And I'd definitely. like to I'd like to feel that. I don't know. I think it would make my art better, but that's theoretical because I'm not sure. Uh huh. I've never experienced it. Yeah. Um, but there's a freedom in it for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's like we were talking about like that clenched fist, different, different, yeah. um, uh, what scenario or whatever, but, um, it's the same idea. It's like, you want to be able to release that clenched fist a little bit. And it's like, yeah. you, you want to be able to breathe a little bit. And there's this thing that I, I always remember the story, but I don't remember, um, who it was about, who said it, but it was this person who, was working in maybe he was a writer or a poet um i heard this story so long ago my brain just never retained the person but he was a writer or a poet and um he was just working at the post office that's what he was doing and he preferred it above anything else he was just like no i like it i'm working at the post office and what's great about it is it's just it's monotonous yeah i'm just there i'm doing my job it frees up all this mental time and I just get to think about what I got to write later. Yeah. And I go home and I write it and it's great. And clearly he became famous enough for me to know this story. Um, it would help if I knew, remembered who it was, but, (laughs) um, but I mean, I mean, there's value in that story. It's like just being able to like open up the mental space for it. It's like mental space, but also just sort of like, the freedom to be like, well, I don't need it for the money. And if you don't need something for the money that you just get to actually truly enjoy what you're making, you know? So there, there is, there's a really beautiful freedom and being able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's something I hope for in my future is, is, uh, I want to see what it looks like. I'm Mm -hmm. just curious, you know, what do I make when, when I don't have that weight of, of, having to monetize mm-hmm. it, you know, yeah. hanging over me. Well, that's what I'm in the middle of trying to figure out though. Yeah. Is like, you know, part of that time is I feel like for the first time in a while, I can afford myself the yeah. time, uh, to carve out for myself. But 
I am out of practice, you know? So it's yeah. like, I don't know what that's really going to look like. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of trying to find, figure out what does balance looks like, look like, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yep. Balance and everything. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's a good place to wrap it up. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm so excited to share this conversation. I loved it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I came in, I haven't done one of these for a while and, uh, I thought, I, you know, I was worried I, I was just going to be clumsy and stupid. And, <laughs> um, I, I immediately remember why we stayed up till three in the morning at the yeah, Portrait right. Society. <laughs> it's so easy to talk to you. Um, thanks for sharing your thoughts and, and, um, can we tell people just where to find you? Uh, um, Sure. Instagram um, and, and your whatever, whatever it is, wherever they can find you. Yeah, I, I don't have many. It's my uh, my Instagram and my website. So my website's my name, Jennifer Gennari dot com. And uh, Instagram Gennari is G-E-N-N-A-R-I. That's correct. OK. And uh, Instagram is at Jen underscore art. So that's it. All right. Yeah. So check her out there. She's got phenomenal work. And uh, I'm really grateful we could um, get you on camera and, and get some of your thoughts because I think you're, you're incredibly thoughtful, uh, purposeful in what you do, and extremely great at what you do. So I'm really grateful we could um, share more of you with people. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I had a great time. This is wonderful. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. All right. <laughs> That's it. We're done. <laughs> We're done. Yay. We All did right. it. <laughs> Let's go listen to some music. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we got to do Michael Hurley. Ooh, my ears can breathe. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, it was really fun. Cool.